Hey there, I'm estate planning attorney Paul Rabelais, and in this video, I am going, going to describe what you can do as part of your overall estate planning strategy to provide appropriately for your spouse. Now, married couples customarily go through the estate planning process together. Often, providing for one's spouse is the most important objective of someone, even more so often than providing for children or other beneficiaries, making the estate settlement easy, see the, see the video link above, avoiding disputes, or even avoiding taxes. Those people who put providing for their spouse as most important are often thinking, I I'm married up and my spouse married down. My spouse has had to put up with my shenanigans for decades, so the least I can do is make sure my spouse is adequately provided for from my estate. Now, failing to provide properly for your spouse can create a host of problems for your spouse in the future. Court guardianship proceedings when you become incapacitated, having to go through a court and attorney involved probate proceeding for months or years after you pass away, having to pay significant sums of tax upon your death, being involved in a difficult estate dispute after you die, or having to get permission from others to sell your home or transact other assets after you pass away. So I'm going to break down the estate planning aspects of providing for your spouse into how to provide for your spouse, for your spouse while you are alive, and then I'll address how to provide for your spouse when you pass away. So you likely need to take some steps now to provide that your spouse can manage things and make decisions if during your lifetime you become incapacitated. I've personally been involved in the legal guardianship proceedings, for example, when a husband neglects to get his legal affairs in order and then suffers a stroke or illness or injury, and he does not have the legal capacity to access his financial accounts that are solely in his name, and he does not have the capacity to sign to sell a piece of real estate that needs to be sold, and he does not have the capacity to continue to run his business. His wife literally is required to sue him, have a judge declare him incompetent, and then appoint the wife or someone else as his legal guardian, all at a time when havoc is being wreaked due to the husband's incapacity. Really, no one should ever put their spouse through that. So what do you do to provide for your spouse so that during your lifetime, you don't put, put a spouse through that? Let's discuss five things you should consider. First, create a durable power of attorney, not just any old power of attorney. I've seen enough inadequate power of attorney legal instruments over the years, but assuming you have the complete trust that your spouse will act in your best interests when you become incapacitated, consider giving your spouse power of attorney with broad powers, which typically include buying and selling real estate, handling tax matters, including deathbed gifting that may be tax advantageous, the ability to create and fund trusts, the ability to handle retirement accounts that are solely in your name, and the power to deal with your digital assets and digital accounts. In many situations, powers like this must be expressly stated in the power of attorney instrument. Next, parties can be fickle when presented with a power of attorney, so the more express the powers you grant, the more likely things will go smoothly for your spouse. Second, make sure you sign, depending upon which state you live in, the appropriate healthcare legal documents. Depending upon your state, these may be called a healthcare power of attorney, medical power of attorney, healthcare proxy, or advanced healthcare directive. Appropriately executed, these instruments allow your spouse in these days of medical records privacy to retrieve or access your medical records and make treatment decisions on your behalf when you can't make them for yourself. In absence of you signing these healthcare documents, state law may provide that by default, your spouse has the ability to make your healthcare decisions when you can't, but it's always smoother and cleaner if you expressly document your wishes by giving your spouse this legal authority and the proper instruments. And you will want to make sure that either in your healthcare legal documents or in a separately signed HIPAA authorization document, you give your spouse that express authority to access your protected health information. Third, while we just discussed enabling your spouse to deal with your medical issues when you can't, we did not specifically address the living will situation. 
This is typically addressed in a separate standalone living will legal instrument, or it may be addressed in your state's advanced healthcare directive. Nonetheless, people often mistakenly think a healthcare power of attorney is a pull the plug authorization, but that's not always true. You see, you have the right to make your own treatment decisions, and by signing a living will, you are making your own decision in advance, and that decision is often expressed so that you direct your family and doctors to honor your wishes to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining procedures if you are in a vegetative state with no chance of recovery. Some married people see a real benefit in signing a living will, documenting those wishes, because the living will can relieve your spouse from that difficult burden of terminating your life. Rather, if you provide your spouse with your living will, your spouse will merely be honoring your wishes, which can relieve your spouse from guilt that may be associated if you have no living will instrument. Fourth, even though setting up a revocable living trust is generally perceived as an avoid probate when I die tool or strategy, your living trust can make things easier for your spouse during your lifetime. By taking an asset that is in your name and transferring it to your revocable living trust during your lifetime, then if you and your spouse are appropriately designated as co-trustees of your revocable living trust, then your spouse can transact that asset if you are unavailable, out of town, or incapacitated without having to run the risk of a third party not honoring your durable power of attorney. And a fifth tip, again, if you have the necessary trust in your spouse, is to simply add your spouse as a signer on your bank accounts. Too many times a spouse gets sick, has several hundred thousand dollars in a bank savings account, and no one can access it immediately because the spouse is not a signer on the account. Now, if your spouse is not a signer on your bank accounts, there's probably a reason why you set it up that way. So this is just another one of those things to consider when the circumstances are appropriate. So that covers what to do so that your spouse can be provided for during your lifetime with your estate plan. Now let's address what you can do to make things easier for your spouse when you die. I'm going to address six areas in your estate planning where you can provide for your spouse when you pass away. First, now some people don't realize you have this option until, well, you hear it from someone like me, because most people think that the way everyone provides for their spouse is simply to leave their entire estate to their spouse. But leaving your entire estate to your spouse, which usually works out great for your spouse, may not meet all of your comprehensive estate planning needs. For example, you could leave your entire estate to your spouse, this is great for your spouse, but then your spouse, either intentionally or unintentionally, leaves that estate to their next spouse or to someone who may have adversely influenced them, and now you created a real mess. So note that you can still provide for your spouse and protect the future inheritance of your children or other beneficiaries. And you can do this by leaving your estate to a trust for your spouse. Your spouse receives all the trust income after your death and is authorized to receive principal distributions from the trust. But you get to direct where the trust estate goes when your spouse later passes away. This spousal trust option, when crafted appropriately, can perfectly allow a married person to both provide for their spouse and balance the desire to ultimately ensure that your children or other beneficiaries will inherit when your surviving spouse later passes away. Second, you could provide a combination of outright and in-trust bequests. For example, you could say, when I pass away, I want my spouse to own my $1 million home or whatever it's worth. And my spouse can do whatever my spouse wants to do with that home. But the rest of my estate will go in a trust upon my death with my spouse receiving trust income and defined principal distributions. But when my spouse dies, the trust estate will revert back to my beneficiaries, not my spouse's future beneficiaries. And those beneficiaries of my spouse may or may not be the same beneficiaries that I would select. Third, if you want to provide for your spouse when you pass away, consider naming your spouse as both the executor of your will and the trustee of any trust that you establish, particularly that spousal trust that I mentioned a moment ago. 
When you name your spouse as the executor of your will, the trustee of your living trust, and the trustee of the spousal trust, subtrust, let's call it, you give your spouse the authority and the duty to really call the shots regarding your estate settlement and the management of, your, of assets after your death. Fourth, taxes. Obviously, you don't want to leave your spouse with a bunch of back income taxes, but what I'm focusing on, focusing on is setting up your estate legal documents so that absolutely zero federal estate tax will be due when you die, regardless of the size of your estate and regardless of the federal estate tax exemption in the year of your death. There could be nothing worse than your spouse being forced to sell your prized possessions immediately after your death in order to create liquidity or cash to pay the 40% of your estate value estate tax, which would be due within nine months after your death. This requirement that your spouse pay this tax is completely unavoidable by taking advantage of the unlimited estate tax marital deduction provisions in our Internal Revenue Code, which generally permit couples to set up their estate so that no tax is required to be paid when the first spouse dies. That tax gets generally deferred until after the surviving spouse dies. But you have to be proactive in your estate planning legal documents to take advantage of this unlimited estate tax marital deduction. And since we do not know what our unpredictable government will do with the estate tax exemption in the future, you wanna make sure you cover this estate tax avoidance aspect of your estate planning. Fifth, it is very common for a spouse who has a priority of providing in the best way possible for their spouse to want to arrange their estate to enable their spouse to eliminate the requirement that there be a court and attorney involved probate when you die. I've made a few videos about setting up a revocable living trust to avoid probate, and I've linked you to one above so that you can find out more. And six, I suppose it is worth mentioning in this video that perhaps to avoid uh, difficulty for your spouse, you could insert no contest provisions in your estate documents. Whether you anticipate someone after your death making your spouse's life difficult while going through your estate settlement process, know that a no contest clause can be a deterrent to someone attempting to harass your spouse by making frivolous claims as part of your estate settlement process. So there you go. If you have a spouse that you deeply care for, like I do, You'll want to consider all of the things mentioned in this video when creating and maintaining your estate plan with the primary objective being, I want to take care of my spouse. Thanks and have a great day and have a great life.